compliment. Okay. Sorry, I have to ask you, but you're probably the best ones to answer this anyway. What are symbols? Not bang bang symbols like in the band, but symbols of things that represent something else. What are they? Well, oh, I guess I answered that, didn't I? All right. So, uh, what's a symbol for Thanksgiving? A turkey. Any other symbols for Thanksgiving? A pumpkin. Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, that's correct. And uh, is there a symbol for Easter? Easter bun. Okay. What else? An egg, okay. Anything else that might be we might see in the church that's a symbol of Easter? The cross, the empty cross. Okay, so now do we have a symbol for uh, Christmas? Christmas tree. Any others? Candy cane. Oh, you were listening. And presents, right? But first thing that you mentioned was a Christmas tree. Now, if you were going to select a tree to represent Christmas, and you knew all about trees, well, whatever you know about trees, if you were to pick one tree that uh, maybe isn't the one we selected, uh, what would you pick? Do you have a favorite kind of tree? You don't. A palm tree. I kind of like that particularly. It reminds me of Hawaii. It has a nice place to be at Christmas. Why would you pick a palm tree? They're fun to look at. What about an oak tree? What might, why would an oak tree maybe be a good symbol of Christmas? Strong. Good solid wood. One you can depend upon. One you can depend, uh, build on. Uh, any other tree? Well, you can, there's, a, there's a, all, uh, trees, Various trees have all kinds of attributes that are good for one thing or another. There are some woods that are particularly made for furniture because you can carve them. And there are some that are used for uh, uh, building homes. Uh, some just built for temporary shelters. Uh, like when, if the people are in hurricane belts and use plywood because it's easy to put up and take down. But we selected what? What did we select as a church for the Chris oh, for Christmas? For a Christmas tree. A pine tree. Hmm. There are are there some are there some uh, Christmas trees that aren't pine trees? Pardon? You don't know what they're called. Okay, well, the Christmas tree can fall under a big uh, group of trees, but they, they've got a nickname for all these trees that are like the pine tree. Oh, and fir, oh, that's another particular kind of uh, tree. But what do we call this tree when we see it? A lot of people just refer to it as what? Have you ever heard the word evergreen? Okay, and that's what we chose. We chose an evergreen tree, and why do you think we chose the evergreen tree? As compared, the evergreen isn't as strong as an oak. It probably isn't as useful for furniture as other woods. Uh, actually, fine furniture is considered kind of a cheaper wood for making furniture. And it certainly don't have big enough trunks so you can carve furniture out of but there's a simple, simple reason that they picked evergreens. 
That's right. The obvious answer, they say green year round. Most other trees that are not of this family <coughs> have seasons where they go dormant. When they, their leaves, they kind of die for the winter and the leaves fall off and then in the spring they are rebuilt. But the evergreen was selected as a tree because it was constant and it could absorb all kinds of weather. No matter how rough the weather, you very seldom hear of these pine trees or evergreen flowing down. And they're, they're sturdy, but they are alive the whole year. And so a lot of people felt when they were talking about a symbol for Christmas and a Christmas tree, they selected this because it was dependable, it was current, it could sh shed against all kinds of weather and remain healthy and strong. Kind of unchanging, just as God's unchanging. Well, that's a little lesson on trees and a little lesson on some symbol of Christmas. And we've got all kinds of candy this morning because the others haven't had a chance to steal from it yet. But thank you for coming down and, and helping us out. Give me a hand. chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the second verse. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And they went away, and Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out there to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Please be seated. It's always interesting that when you choose a topic or a theme for a particular Sunday, as you go through the week, there are all kinds of things that seem to refer uh, to what you are looking for. It, it's kind of like uh, you might have bought a car that you never knew existed before. You went out to shop and wound up getting a car and you didn't know that they even existed. You hadn't seen any before. But you drive home and suddenly everybody is driving the same car. It's not that there are more of them there, but because you're aware of something, it seemed to jump out all over the place. So, I had a unique experience on Tuesday morning when I went into the post office. There was a long line, as there is now at the post office, well, particularly Maynard. But it was, I came in and there was this line and I saw this woman looking at me. 
And she was not seeing her eyes, spreading her eyes across the, the post office. She was just looking directly. And uh, finally I stopped about six feet in front of her and I said, um, is there something that you're wanting or something that you need? And she said, no, but uh, are you someone I know? I said, well, that's kind of an odd question. If, you, if I'm someone you know, wouldn't you know that it was me? And she said, well, um, you look like somebody I'm very familiar with. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't know where to go with that one. But she said, well, what is your name? And I told her my name and I asked her hers and she said, do you know me? And I said, no, I do now. But no, she said, I guess I don't know you. It's a case of mistaken identity. Went into the bank to take a CD and they asked for a copy of my driver's license. Well, what do you need my driver's license for? Uh, for identification purposes. Well, I said, I'm sorry, but I come in here twice a week. And everybody knows me here. Well, we still need your driver's license. Okay, but I don't quite understand why. And she said, well, it's to make positive of your identification. We don't want any mistaken identity. Well, where does that go to? as far as the gospel lesson is concerned. Well, it seems in this very odd passage from the 11th chapter of Matthew, that John the Baptist has a very bad case of mistaken identity. And it's really peculiar because this is John the Baptist. This is not somebody that Jesus meets along the way. But John the Baptist is in the last stages of his life because he's in prison, imprisoned by Herod. And he asks his disciples to go and find Jesus and ask him if he's really the Messiah, the one that he's been talking about. He's got a question. Is this the Messiah or should we look for another? When they ask Jesus, he says, well, go and tell John this, the blind see, the deaf hear, those that are sick are healed, and there's good news preached to the poor. That's my identification. John the Baptist, from what we understand, is a second cousin of Jesus. They grew up together. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, were cousins. And Jesus, in the chapter, in fact, chapter 3 of Matthew, there's this, the whole chapter 3 is dedicated to the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is standing there, and he's preaching about this coming Messiah, and he comes and sees Jesus, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And he said, This is the man to whom I'm talking about. And Jesus asked him to be baptized. And he said, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. I'm not worthy even to take your sandals. We see a John so absolutely committed to this other person, this Jesus. How in the world, later in his life, does he come to wonder if he is a case of mistaken identity? Well, in order to examine that, let us look at some other ideas about mistaken identity. Identity. Have you ever done anything or thought anything or did some improper stuff and when you were confronted about it, you said, well, that's not really me. That is not, this is a case of mistaken identity. It, yes, 
those were actions that were taken, but that's not me. And of course, that's ignoring the obvious. Absolutely, it is you. How many times in, in counseling have I had one spouse say to the other, I don't know you anymore. You are not the man or you are not the woman that I married. This behavior that I see is not you. And I've had some people even argue with me, that's not really my husband, that's somebody else. Well, no it isn't, and unless you realize that it is, then you can't deal with the problem. Because that is a part of him or her. Sometimes we mistake even identifying ourselves properly. Sometimes we make mistakes in recognizing each other properly. Because of one thing. When we have a difference or a problem with mistaken identity, it's because the expectation does not meet reality. Expectation does not meet reality. When we come and we deal with certain people, we have certain preconceived ideas of who they are and how they will react. And you can tell about the people that you know, I pretty much know how they're going to react to this particular thing or how they're going to behave as a whole or how they're going to vote. And if it's different than what we expected, then we have a tendency to say, well, that's the, not the real whatever the name is. That's the problem with John the Baptist. He has some preconceived idea of who Jesus is and what the Messiah is and at the end of his ministry after his ministry before he dies he has a question did I make a mistake because this doesn't look like the man I was talking about what kind of a position was John the Baptist in but well, first of all he had given out to send and preach repentance and baptism and getting yourself ready for the coming Messiah. But his message was a message of judgment. It was what we call those hellfire preachers where we're talking about Jesus is coming with a fury and you better behave, you better get your life in order or you're going to hell. That's kind of the message that John the Baptist had. And one of the things he was expecting Jesus to follow up with him was that his life would pretty much be a cleansing of the people to get rid of their sins, to make them shape up. The idea of talking about forgiveness and understanding and loving your neighbors was not a part of John's vocabulary. It was not even his vision of who Jesus was. So, another reason was that he was angry. He had preached this gospel and he was told to preach. And now he was in prison expecting to die, which he did. What, what, what happened to him? He had gone to Herod, and Herod had just had his brother's wife divorce his brother so that he could marry her. And John came with a vengeance to the capital, to the palace, and accused him of mass impropriety of being a lousy king, of just being mired in immorality. Kings don't like to hear that. Not even do we like to hear things like that. And so he was in prison. And knowing 
the way the king acted, John was expecting some kind of freedom because he was told to preach this message in his mind. And so Jesus is not living up to his expectations, what John is expecting. How can I give my whole life to a thing that God calls me to do and then I'm punished for it instead of rewarded? John doesn't understand that his reward comes later. And so, in this very peculiar passage in the 11th chapter of Matthew, we see a man who is doubting Jesus. What he came for, and what he did, and what his purpose is for us. So, does John get punished for this? No, and Jesus talks to the people in the crowd when John, when the disciples of John leave, and he talks about John in a very positive way. It's not an anger toward John of not being recognized properly or really understand what he was coming for because his life, the disciples didn't understand either until after the resurrection. John was given a task to do. He did it, and he will be rewarded for it but not in the way that John thought. And when we run into a relationship with God or Jesus in our lives, it is the same reason that we get upset, why we have this mistaken identity. We expect God to work certain ways, that Jesus to come to our rescue in certain ways, and when it doesn't happen, we begin to have doubts. And we say, is this really Jesus? Is this really the way God acts? Not understanding the ways of God and that the big reward comes later. How do you wish to be seen? Jesus said, look, go tell John that the sick are healed, the deaf hear, the blind see, and good news is preached to the poor, and that's the way I want to be identified. Not as somebody coming with a sigh and doing a harvest and destroying that which is not part of the kingdom of God. I want to be seen as the redeemer, as the one who brings peace, the one who teaches forgiveness, So, how do you want to be identified? As a person of Christ, what is it that you would like to reflect to people so that they could see the Jesus in you? It might be well to think about that for the week. You know, when I become a part of a group, that was particularly true in the golf club, of course, when I joined it, there were, I'd been with people for two or three years, and one they would get, they would ask, what do you do? What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a minister. <clears throat> and so many of them would have a look of disbelief. You're a minister? Yeah. Is, well, I would have never thought you were a minister. Well, that's interesting. So you tell me what a minister is like. What do they look like? How do they act? Do you find my behavior offensive? Oh, no, no. Uh, is my language improper? Oh, no. What is it that doesn't make me look like a minister? And they would talk about what they conceive the minister to be. And I said, if that's what you conceive a minister to be, then I don't want to be that person. Because usually, it was spoken in terms of judge, being judgmental and condemning and not really practicing what they preach. I don't have any idea whether my behavior reflects the God that I believe in, but I try. 
sometimes we have to focus on those things that we were not looking for, not those wild things that John was thinking about, about destroying all the Romans and making Israel a free land again. And overlook things like bringing good news to the poor and healing, being a healing force in the world. How do you want to be recognized? I don't know if all of you remember this person, but I think some of you older ones will. Johnny Weissmiller. Does that name ring any bells for you? How was Johnny Weissmiller identified? Tarzan. Tarzan. Good. At least we got some audience participating. Johnny Weissmiller was the original Tarzan. He, uh, he acted in a movie, I think he acted in a movie, 38 movies from 1929 to 1976 when he died. He was a five-time Olympic champion in swimming. And he did 12 Tarzan movies. And he made famous that cry of Tarzan where he would beat his chest and yell something between a yodel and a scream. And that was the ape call, and the apes would all come running. All the animals would come running when he would do this. And Johnny once said that it was kind of nice to be in a position where he could say, me, Tarzan, you, Jane, and earn a million dollars a year doing it. My, my father-in-law was a, a swimming competitor, Johnny Weissmiller, top to bottom. But there was an interesting time in 1959 when Johnny Weissmiller, who was very popular in Cuba, was down in Cuba on a golf holiday with four of his friends. And it was at the time of the Castro uh, insurrection. And Johnny Weissmiller and his four people were, were stopped by the rebels in Havana and held captive. They thought they were rich Americans and that they were supporting the present regime and say they took and held them. And Johnny Weissmiller was trying to convince him, probably in broken Spanish, that he was not a spy. And he said, I'm Tarzan. And they said, well, prove that you're Tarzan. And Johnny Weissmiller did that by beating his chest and screaming out his animal cry, the ape call. And they said, he's Tarzan. You let him go. He was released simply on the basis of identity of being able to make a blood curdling yell. How are you identified? When people walk away, what do they see? Have you ever heard somebody say, as you try to explain yourself and who you are, they say, I like you on the hello. You could have stopped right there. That there's something that you communicate of grace, and peace, and love, and understanding. And come on with a smile. How is it that you wish to be identified? Jesus told us, I heal people. I bring good news to the poor. I bring kindness to those who are even enemies. And most of all, I dwell on forgiveness. There are many times that we are involved in, in identity problems. And it's simply because people's expectation of what we say we are don't reach what reality is. So I ask you to look at this text again and think about it. And how you want to be identified so people don't have a mistaken identity about you. Amen.